Circle in Manassas, Virginia, and can be reached at 703-330-3100. Chris McKay is not affiliated with Satir okay. Advisor Networks, LLC, nor Rosenthal Wealth Management Group. Bob Jones is a marketing assistant of Rosenthal Wealth Management Group and is associated with Satir Advisor Networks, LLC. It's time now for Making Money Sense with Larry Rosenthal. Larry is recognized as one of the nation's leading financial and retirement planners and is here right now to answer your questions. Author, speaker, and talk show host, Larry Rosenthal, is dedicated to teaching others financial stewardship from a biblical point of view. Call Larry now. Studio lines are open at 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. Making Money Sense is on the air. And we are back once again for another edition of the Larry Rosenthal Show. Oh, it's so good to be here. You know, some of the things that we see before this, the, uh, the show comes on are, are kind of unique and interesting. If you were only a mouse on the wall, right, Larry? For those of you that are watching, well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to Making Money Sense. I'm Larry Rosenthal, your host. And it is Open Mic Saturday as well as Entertainment Saturday for those of you that are watching on LarryRosenthal.tv. Uh, I don't know. Was any of that stuff on? Uh, no, what, no. What it was, was all happening? hidden from the public view. No one okay, knows Okay, well, let me thing. just give the breakdown of what happened. <laughs> As Chris is counting into my ears, we've got 20 seconds. We've got 18 seconds. We've got 15 seconds. <laughs> well, guess what? My computer crashed right in front of me, right before the show started. So I ran into the other place and got, got a laptop real quick, got that all set up, and then the computer pops back up, and I've got two things going on at the same time, and <laughs> feedback all throughout the studio. Sounds like a rock and roll concert happening in here. Chris is like, no, press that button. I'm on the wrong keyboard. What do I do? And blah, 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 and everything. Anyway, it was a hoot, you're, only to get it in within three seconds. You're it all worked. Planner, but you're Took a- the laptop, didn't even get, just shut it. Anyway, here we are, ready? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, ready to go. You know, it was a lot play, of fun. You play so. a juggler in another life, right? Yeah, Chris, what you were at seven seconds, and I said, plenty of time. Oh, we'll yeah, be no good. Problem. Okay, God there does. you go. So, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to Making Money Sense. Hey, you know what? We had some amazing market action this past week, but is it too much too quick? That's the big question that's floating around right now. When you take a look at everything that's happening in the financial financial press and the economy. So what happened this past week? You know, we, we had um, Chairman Jerome Powell go on 60 Minutes talking a little bit about uh, some issues with commercial banks. We'll talk some about that. Also talking a little bit about, you know, hey, the Fed is probably going to lower three times this year. And then all of a sudden, revised inflation numbers come out. Uh, the end of last, the end of this past week, Thursday, Friday, numbers came out and showing that CPI actually declined a little bit more in December than what was originally registered, which is really good news. And that's what really propelled the uh, the S and P and the tech stocks yesterday on Friday afternoon, uh, lots of new new highs are being hit across the marketplace. P E ratios are, are are climbing, and the question now becomes: Is this real? Where are we? What's going to be? What's what's the case? You know, listen. Here's the bottom line with this: the market is rushing to the fact that the Fed wants to lower rates, and the Fed is saying. We're taking our time. We're slow playing this. That's what's going on right now. So the market is trying to find direction. And and obviously the market wants to r- propel up. The market's going, look at the economy. It's strong. Inflation's dropping. Come on, Fed, just drop those rates. We know you're going to drop those rates and make capital easier to acquire, you know, and, and, and on and on and on. So the market is a forward-looking mechanism. That's what the market's looking at, you know, into the future. So, so we've got the P.E. ratio now sitting at 20 on the S&P. The average last 25, 30 years is 16.6. So it's a little frothy right now. It's a little above where it is. It's at the high of the long-term average um, uh, delta, if you will. What does this mean? This means that earnings need to continue to come in, and they are. We're showing earnings right now. Where's my little earnings thing through through the through the quarter right now? Sixty-seven percent of S and P five hundred uh, companies through Thursday have reported earnings, 
And, and it looks like when you look at blended earnings, earnings that have already reported and estimated earnings for yet to report for the fourth quarter are up 2.7% with sales growth up 0.3.8. That's good numbers. Those are good numbers. So they're not stellar, but they're good numbers. Okay. So we're seeing that happen. We're seeing GDP come back to trend line. We're seeing consumers come back to trend line. We're seeing inflation continuing to, 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 to fray on the edges, coming down, coming down a little bit at a time. And that's what this is. The market is looking at the Fed saying, hey, hurry up. We want to get there now. We want to get there now because the market's a forward-looking discounted mechanism. And the Fed has come out and said, we want to slow play this. We want to make sure that inflation doesn't bounce back up because when you look at how strong the economy is last week, we, we, we hit 355,000 new jobs, which was abo above consens uh, consensus. That means the economy's strong. That means wages can be supportive. That means people will have more money to spend, which is an inflationary force. So you're seeing stuff on both sides. Good news is really good news for the expansion, the growth, and the stability of the economy. But at the same time, it's a little bit bad news on the Fed saying, wait a minute, inflation could come back. So this is what's happening. This is why we expect to see some volatility. Um, the markets are trying to predict when the Fed's going to lower. So last uh, this, this past Thursday, I did, a, I did our uh, Rosenthal Wealth Management 2024 Economic Outlook. Boatload Market of fun. Boatload and of fun. Economic Outlook. Yep, we, had, we did two webinars, one from noon to one and then one from 6 to 7 p.m. Yep. And they were both live. And we got into the weeds on the economy and things like that. And, and you know, this is what is, is still the unanswered question is when the Fed starts to lower, at what rate will they lower? In other words, are they going to start to lower 25 basis points, 35 basis points, 70 basis points? How much are they going to lower each time? For how long are they going to lower? And... And, and what is the, the uh, uh, and, and when does it start? So those three are questions are unanswered. And the Fed's saying, wait a minute here. We are thinking we're going to lower three times this year. The markets have been saying six times. I'm in the camp personally of maybe four, all right? But you have inflation right now at about 3.4%, and the Fed funds rate is restrictive at five and a half. So if, if inflation continues to drop slowly down, and let's suppose we stay in that low threes, upper twos for this year, I don't see it getting to 2% in 2024. Yeah, wouldn't okay? that be nice? It would be, but I don't see that happening. Yeah. But the Fed may come out, and, and, and here's what's going to move the markets. If the Fed comes out and says, hey, you know what? We messed up. The economy has stalled way too much. We have to lower rates in order to grease the gears of the economy. The markets are really going to go crazy. They're not going to like that too much because now the Fed is coming back and saying, tilt, we may go into a recession. Mm. On the other hand, if the Fed says, you know what, we want to lower policy to become more neutral to what's actually happening in the economy, they might use words like that, which means we're just going to take a little pressure off that five and a half rate and try to bring it down toward that inflation rate to get a more of a neutral position. The markets are going to do really well if that's the language. But we're not ready for that language. The Fed has clearly said, hey, we're going to slow play this because they don't want to have what happened back in the late 70s, early 80s, where inflation reared its head again, mm. and then we go back to the drawing board with all this stuff. So that's what's happening. That's exactly what happened this past week in the market. Now, enjoy it, okay, because the market went way, way up. So enjoy, enjoy that. s and P's at an all-time high, which is wonderful news, right? And that goes to another whole conversation of people. You know, some people now are saying, should I get out because the market's at a high? Mm. Well, how many times over the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years has the market been at an all-time high? A lot. A lot. It keeps on dancing across those mountain peaks to where oh, it is yeah. today. So did you get out in the past all the time that it hit market highs? No. You stayed invested, right? The second thing is, what about the people that are saying, you know what? I really wish the market would pull back so that I can get another bite at the apple because I'm still sitting on the sidelines. 
I listened and said, oh, you know what? Fear, fear, fear. Mm. And the markets didn't do well and blah, blah, blah. Or they're not going to do well. And they did last year and so far this year. They're hoping for a pullback so they can put money back in. Guess what? What would happen if you're sitting on the sideline right now and you're saying, man, if I could just have the markets pull back, I'll put the money in. I know I'll go back in. Will you? When there's blood in the streets, when the markets are, are, are all red, is that when you're going to go put the money in? Because that's why you got out before. So now all of a sudden this time it's different? No. So if you have money sitting on the sideline right now, what do you have to do? You have to take a look at what I call building positions. How do you build positions? You're going to introduce cash into a market that's at an all-time high. Well, first thing you have to assess is what is your time frame on this? How long until you want those dollars back to you for a, a car or a college fund or a, a ski condo in Vermont or, or retirement planning or whatever it may be, right? How long until you want those dollars back? Well, if it's three years, five years, nine years, 15 years, that's how you take a look at starting to build positions. So now you say, well, what sectors do I want to be in? Let's suppose you say, I want to be in technology. Everybody's talking about technology today with AI and bioinformatics oh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So, so now you say, all right, I'm going to start buying some technology sectors. Well, you just start accumulating shares for that length of time. Let's suppose you want this money back in nine years, okay, or, or in five years. Start nibbling. Start when the, when the market pulls back, because the market doesn't go up every day. When the market pulls back from, a, from time to time, go in and make some buys. And just start establishing a position, start acquiring, start building, start, start creating an inventory worth of shares in that space that you want to be. So that's seven years from now down the road, you would have had a pot of shares that, mo that has the probability to be higher way down the road than they are today, even though we're at market highs today. So you just have to deal with your entry point. How do I start establishing a position? Now, somebody else might say, well, wait a minute, why don't I just put it all in right now? That's fine. Put it all in right now. And if the market pulls back 15% and sits there for nine months, mm. then you're just going to have a lot of pain for yeah. a while until yeah. it starts to accelerate again. So there's really no right or wrong way to do this. You have to establish a plan on how you want to uh, build these positions going forward in a, in a peak market for, for money that you want to reintroduce right now. Is this a back up the truck thing, or is this something you just kind of dollar cost into? I mean, I'm not ready to say back the truck up at all. I'm not ready. In, in this economy right now, I am not ready to say wave the all clear flag. We, we've, got, we've got geopolitical issues. We've got um, uh, uh, the Fed who has stepped to the sideline mm. but says we're going to slow play this. OK, but I am much, much more optimistic as I stand here today than I was, Chris, uh, at Thanksgiving time last year. But you're not getting in, you're not going all in. You're kind of just getting a little bit at a time going back into the. Market. So there, there, there's two things going on here. If, if you're talking about somebody who says I'm scared to introduce new money, mm -hmm. you know, cash that I've saved or pull it out of bonds because I was I, I didn't like the markets or whatever. If if if, if that's what that's the first conversation which is how do you introduce? You do dollar cost averaging. You, you, you find where you want to be in. You start buying a little bit here and there. And then on red days when the market's down, that's when you go in and you buy a bigger bite. You take a bigger gotcha. bite out of that apple and you establish the shares. You establish, you build your position of shares. You know, the, the, the do, everybody focuses on the dollar value. Focus on the, on the number of shares you have. Because it's the share value that creates the dollar. So you want to be in the game of buying more shares, okay? Somebody puts in $1,000 into a stock, and the following month it's worth $900. Well, if you liked it at, at last month's price, which was higher, why would you not love it now when the price is lower? You can put that same $1,000 in and acquire more shares to it. Unless something fundamentally went wrong with the company or something, right? Well, absolutely. You, yeah. you know, the, 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 the key to research is three steps. Research, research, <laughs> and research, okay? The three R's. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so that's kind of the deal here. Where the markets are, great market right now to be involved in, without a doubt. We've got some very key leadership in stocks, almost 2023 2.0 at this point, okay? Another replay could be 
uh, shaping up, not as far as performance goes, but as far as sectors goes right now. You talked it, about the in the S and P five hundred during the webinar, which I thought was kind of interesting, and how technology stocks were way up there at the top of that list, right? And that's is that something we should consider more of as waiting towards the technology at this point, or is that well, when you take a look at investing, you're looking at three cycles of investing time frames. You're looking at something that's more tactical and short term. You're looking at business cycles, and then you're looking at long term themes, thematic investing. Mm -hmm. So when you bring up technology, Chris, right away that resonates with me, which is long term thematic investing. My question to you back is this. From a technological standpoint, do you think we're done developing oh, no printer capabilities? Do you yeah. think we're done developing the way you and I send and receive information personally and business-wise? Do you think that we have built out AI as much as it's going to be built out right now? Do you think the computing power capability that we have has hit a ceiling right now? Or do you think five years from now, it could be a lot more different and efficient and quicker and more yeah, accurate? Yeah. We're on the leading edge of all that. We're just starting. That's exactly, that, that's exactly the way I feel about it. So from a thematic, a long-term thematic standpoint, now you say, well, do I want to buy a basket of stocks in that space, such as a mutual fund or an ETF, or do I want to go directly into individual stocks, or maybe it's both, you know? But, but, but so, so that's a long-term thematic type of a scenario, whereas you're looking at something that's more short-term in nature, business cycle type of thing, you have to sit back and go, well, wait a minute here. The leadership in the market is that tech space you just talked about, right? But what happens if something goes awry with a couple of those tech companies with earnings and stuff? You can see a substantial pullback, so now you still want to have some of your old blue chips, brick and mortars, that type of stuff, to to create some ballast in there. You know, so it really goes to to the overall design and risk acceptance level that someone may have or have not in in their overall portfolio there. So, but that's basically what happened the last uh, this past week in the markets. The markets are going, hurry up, Fed, hurry up, come on, come on, <laughs> cut, 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 we're cut, ready, ready. and the Fed's going easy. We're going to slow play this a little bit because we want to make sure that our mandate is accomplished, which is price stability and maximum employment. It's not just the markets, though, Larry. A lot of people are looking like, wow, those interest rates are too high. I can't afford to go out and buy anything new until they come back down. So. And that's exactly what the Fed wants. The yeah. Fed wants a, num a certain number of cars on the automobile uh, car dealer lot so that there's give and take on the price. They want it not to be in the home market. They don't want it to be a buyer's market or a seller's market. They want that negotiation, right? They want you to be able to go to the bicycle store and order your bicycle that you want right off the shelf, okay? That's what they want. And when, when, when people make that comment of, hey, interest rates are too high, I can't finance a new car, I can't finance a new home, I can't do this, that, and the other because rates are too high, that means that people aren't going to spend money, mm -hmm. which means the economy slows down, which in turn brings down inflation prices to get us back to that next cycle again. Yeah. When I was doing the webinar this past week on our market outlook in 2024, I talked a lot about where what cycle we're in right now okay we had we had people from all over the country on this webinar it was, it was it was it, it was good not a lot of questions because it was more of a data dump of economics kind of like what i'm talking about here this morning okay but at the same time the the uh uh we're at the second stage i'd call it the second stage of this fed cycle the first stage was when the fed said oops we've got inflation we have to raise rates very fast and they've done that. They've raised rates 11 times in 14 months. And then in month 17, they officially hit the pause button. Mm -hmm. And now we're at the pause stage. The next part of the cycle is, are they going to raise again or start to drop? And, and indications show right now that they're going to start to lower. The question is when, how often, and how much each time. So Before we take that break, though, I was going to ask you the question about uh, the supply chain. You know, COVID for the longest time had really put the stops and the brakes on all of that. Are we back? Uh, to full speed on everything now at this point? Is everything back and running and our supply chain? No, we still have up? supply chain disruption, Chris. We, uh, we still have, first of all, we've had a lot of companies starting to onshore manufacturing in the U.S., and you just can't pop a factory up overnight. So that's a little bit of a delay and extra cost. You also have companies and countries around the globe 
re-diversifying their manufacturing base geogra- uh, 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 geographically mm-hmm. uh, because there was a lot of risk coming out of one one place. So that takes some time. And then you've got the geopolitical uh, oh, boy, issues uh, about yeah. shipping and shipping lanes and stuff like that. So there's always something going on uh, when, when you take a look at that. And those are, those are inflationary pressures, too. Those are inflationary pressures. So we're not out of the woods yet. Stay diversified, balanced, but keep your eye on the long game here and make sure that you're in sectors that you feel are going to be growing for yourself. Hey, you know what? It is Open Mic Saturday. We talked a whole lot about (laughs) economics and the economy and the markets here because you need to know this stuff, all right? But uh, it is Open Mic Saturday. We are here to serve, to give you financial education on any subject at all. Give us a call with taxes inflation, the Fed, fiscal policy, estate planning, mutual funds, ETF, stocks, whatever's on your mind today, give us a call about your 401k, the government TSP, 855-ROSE-123, 855-ROSE-123, 855-767-3123. We're back in a moment with more Making Money Sense. You are listening to Making Money Sense live with Larry Rosenthal. Phone lines are open for your retirement and financial planning questions at 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. More Making Money Sense in a moment. There are still too many countries that give little or no assistance to disabled children. In third world nations, these children could be left alone while parents try to eke out a living. About 10 years ago, residents of Prince William and Fauquier counties in Virginia formed Children with Disabilities Fund International. It focuses on the needs of disabled children. CDFI's current work in Jamaica and Kenya supports about 300 disabled children and their families. For some of these children, they're getting the care they need for the first time in their lives. CDFI recently began an individual child sponsorship program in an effort to better meet the needs of these disabled children. To choose your child to sponsor, go to thecdfi.org. That's thecdfi.org. Your gift will help transform not only a disabled child's life, but the lives of their parents and of the surrounding community. Go to thecdfi.org. Make a difference. Go to the cdfi.org. You've seen and heard him on Fox Business, CNBC, and the Wall Street Journal. Larry Rosenthal is here right now to take your calls at 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. This is the Larry Rosenthal Show. Welcome back to the Larry Rosenthal Show. 855-767-3123 is the number to call. 855-ROSE-123. To talk to Larry Rosenthal, who is live here in studio with us and was live this last week with the webinar. We'd love to hear from you, by the way. The number's on the bottom of your screen there if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're not, then just give us a call at 855-767-3123, Larry. Yeah, we'll be uh, opening up next week. We're going to be doing – we'll open up registration for our March webinar, okay? Um, It's going to be on – where is the date on this? It will be on March 7th, I believe it's going to be, Chris. March Madness coming up, huh? Yeah, well, March Madness and another March webinar, right? <laughs> there you go. There you go. But next week, you can March go to my Saturday. website, LarryRosenthal.com, and you can register uh, for our, our upcoming webinar on March 7th. It's uh, or the first Thursday in March is what yeah, it is. Yeah, it's the 7th. Yeah, so that's the March yep. the 7th. Yep. Okay. And it's going to be asking and answering the tough questions when it comes to retirement planning. So a lot of interaction will be will be involved on that. So that's going to be a lot of fun, that webinar. So we'll open up the registration for it next week. You can go on my website, LarryRosenthal.com, and go ahead and register right there. But, you know, we're talking about the markets at a high, Chris, and I pulled up some quotes here real quick. Uh, um, and, and take a look at what Bernard Barch said. He's uh, been a presidential advisor in the past, a uh, very wise man on Wall Street. And he said, try to buy at the bottom and sell at the top. It can't be done except by liars, okay? (laughs) There you go. And then Warren Buffett, if you're thinking about owning a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. 
right? <laughs> and then Peter Lynch, great investor back in the 80s. We're going old school here, okay? Know what you own and know why you own it. When you look at buying a position. Because my neighbor in, told me it was a good stock, Larry. There you go. Aunt Millie said, get this, okay? Yeah, right. right. And, and there's nothing wrong with that sometimes, but understand how it works for you. And ask yourself, what has to go wrong in the economy for that investment not to really work out? That's the big deal, okay, uh, w w with it all. I had some questions come up this past week on how to avoid probate, and I wanted to talk about that today. How to avoid probate, <clears throat> you know, 46% of Americans have a will, uh, which kind of says we need to do some work on that, right? Okay, uh, so, so how do you avoid probate? What is probate? What's the purpose of probate? But a will doesn't pro avoid probate, though, right? No, it doesn't. Okay. Why do you even want to avoid probate? So a lot of people think that if I just put something in my will, like if I have an investment account, and I say I will it in my will to you, Chris, um, and then I go to heaven, uh, the, 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 the investment account says, well, there's no beneficiary attached to it. So there's no operation of law or titling attached to it. So therefore, it has to go through the court's distribution process known as probate. And so when it goes through probate, that's when the judge says, okay, where's it, excuse me, where's it going to go? So whether the will is deemed valid or invalid, it has to go through probate. So how do you avoid well, probate time delays? It's public. Court cost, attorney's fees, and sometimes family squabbles can take place if something's going through the probate process. People start saying, so I want it. You don't and always get along as a family? Come on. Sometimes, yeah, yeah unfortunately, I know. I know. unfortunately. So how do you avoid probate? Uh, you, you, you make sure that, that the asset that you have has a way, a means to transfer to a charity or to another person. Okay, and it can be done simply by attaching a beneficiary form, like in an investment account, it can be a transfer on death form, TOD, a bank account, POD, payable on death. You can name a trust, you can take an investment and put it inside of a trust. So now if you pass the trust, well, the trust owned it to begin with since you put it in there, but now the trust will control the distribution. Or you can jointly title it. I can title it between my name and your name, Chris. And if I pass, go to heaven, and now all of a sudden, boom, there you are. You have the account, right? Okay, so, so those are the ways that you avoid probate. And a lot of people are simply not under the impression that, or don't understand the three or four different ways that you can avoid probate on assets. <clears throat> Everybody, A lot of people think, oh, I have to put it into a trust. No, that's not the case. On the other hand, a trust serves for more protection for your heirs than a simple beneficiary type form does. So check it out. So, so how do you go about investigating this for yourself? That's the key. Because we could sit here all day long and talk about you need to do this and that and blah, blah, blah. But you know what? And that's what sometimes a lot of attorneys do. They, they give you a document that says, okay, now you need to go do this, 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 and this. And they're going, well, how do I even do that? So the way that you start this process for yourself, and I've talked about this before in the, in, 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 on the radio show, and I bring this up a handful of times a year because I see the need of this all the time. And the way you do this is you just simply write down your assets and then write down how that asset is owned. So you have your car. It's in your name, Chris. If something happens to you, what happens to the car? Where does the title of that car go? Depends you on if it's paid an, off have, or not, Larry. That's yeah, there you go. You have a bank account, right? Mm. Okay, and it's in your name and your wife's name. If something happens to either one of you, it goes to the other. Mm. That avoids probate. If something happens to both of you, then what happens to that bank account? That would then go through probate, right? So forth and so on with each item. So, so, so write down the asset how it's titled, and there's 12 different ways to title assets, and then how does it go to the next, the, the, the next of kin or your beneficiary or a charity? That's the way things, that, that's how you can investigate whether or not you will be subject to probate as well. A lot of times it happens in homes. 
Husband and wife have that home. Most, most titles are joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Something happens to one, the other one has it, okay? And then all of a sudden, the surviving spouse says, well, I'm going to put my kids on the house as well. So if something happens to me, they get it right away. But now they assume the, their parents' cost basis, and it could be a big tax bomb for them. So you don't want to do that. You want to make it TOD or put it into a trust. So it avoids probate. The kids get a stepped-up basis in value, and you're off and running from that particular standpoint. So if you want to understand how to avoid probate, give us a call. If you want to understand it, go to my website, uh, LarryRosenthal.com. Send us off an email, and we'll be happy to send you out information. We've got a whole kit on the basics in estate planning, the ins and outs of probate, how to avoid probate, what it is that you should be looking at, how to take the inventory of your assets and things like that. Hey, we're going to take a quick break here at the bottom of the hour. Give us a call at 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123 on this open mic Saturday. Whatever's on your mind today, give us a call. 855-ROSE-123. I'm Larry Rosenthal. We'll be back in a moment with more Making Money Sense. You are listening to Making Money Sense live with Larry Rosenthal. Phone lines are open for your retirement and financial planning questions at 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. More Making Money Sense in a moment. And here's another Money Minute with Larry Rosenthal. So many different ways to invest money. Lump sum deposits, buy and hold, market timing. How about dollar cost averaging? Put the same amount of money into the same investment at every interval, whether it's monthly, quarterly, annually, whatever it may be. This gives you the greatest opportunity to get the average price over the long term of the investment because one of the secrets to creating wealth is the acquisition of shares. You want to keep buying more and more shares over time. On the flip side, when you're in your retirement years and you want to distribute dollars to yourself for income, do the same thing in reverse. Dollar cost average out during your retirement years. You've seen and heard him on Fox Business, CNBC, and The Wall Street Journal. Larry Rosenthal is here right now to take your calls at 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. This is The Larry Rosenthal Show. Well, welcome back to The Larry Rosenthal Show. 855-767-3123 is that number to call. 855-ROSE-123. We'll talk to Larry Rosenthal. And you can watch him and us. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's interesting when you watch us there on uh, YouTube and it is at LarryRosenthal.tv. We'd love to have you uh, join us. 855-767-3123 or LarryRosenthal.tv. Hit that right. And name. don't forget to subscribe at that uh, on and the YouTube channel, LarryRosenthal.tv, which, by the way, Chris, we are in the process of revamping our entire website. Uh, some really neat looking thing thing technology again? that's coming out out there. So we're going to be uh, doing a lot of that stuff coming up soon okay, so cool. had a big meeting on that the other day and uh it was a lot of fun uh, i got to choose some pictures so there you go, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's what they let me do right <laughs> right so you hey you know in ecclesiastes the lord talks about in chapter 5 verse 10 whoever loves money never has enough whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income this too is meaningless this, too, is meaningless. If we continue to chase after the dollar because we think it's going to provide X, Y, Z, solve A, B, C, help in D, E, F, and all that kind of stuff, no, where the Lord Jesus said, basically, look, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart will be as well. Let's make, let's make the Lord our treasure, okay? And then we can then manage assets according to stewardship principles. You know, so we always have to keep things real when it when it comes to that. Talking about managing assets, I had this question come up. It's a it's a rare question, but it comes up, and it came up this past week. I wanted to talk about it. I've actually done this before with with people. I've shown them how to do this. Okay, and it helps in estate planning. When you think about estate planning, you're re if you're the beneficiary, you're receiving assets from an heir or, or, or someone, right? You're, you're, or not an heir, but from someone else in your family or friends. So you're, you're on the receiving side of this. 
And maybe for tax reasons, you don't want it. Maybe for tax reasons, it's not a good time. Maybe for personal reasons, you would have wished it went to somebody else, okay? Because when that beneficiary form was filled out years ago in a lot of, a lot of times, family situations were one way. Maybe they've changed to a different way now. Maybe you're in a position where you don't actually need this or anything like that. Um, Chris, go ahead and get that call. I can't see the screener here. Sure thing. Okay, so we've got uh, we got is it is it Mitchell or Michael? Michelle. Oh, the Michelle. We might we we forgot an E. Sorry about that, Michelle. Glad to have you well, on the program. What's your question for Larry? There's no E. There's no E on it. Ah, but it's okay. Michelle. Gotcha. Gotcha. What's your question for Larry? So what I'd like to find out is when using the transfer on death for real property, does that have to be recorded at the recorder of deeds, or can yes. I just call the uh, mortgage company and have them to title um, the property that way. No, Michelle, it needs to be recorded where the county has your home recorded because that's actually on the title, okay? Once it's on the title like that, then the mortgagee, the mortgage company, as you call it, will go ahead and put it on that, that, that document as well. So it needs to go to the county recorder's office where the home is titled. That's how you do it. Okay. And they would have those forms right there for you, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so I just ask them for the form so I can um, title it that way? Yes, exactly. Okay. And if you have any questions on it, you can just give our office a call. We have an office over there uh, in in Catonsville in Maryland, and we've helped lots of people do that over in Maryland, okay? Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate the phone call. You have a great weekend. Let's bring Bill on the line from Virginia. Good morning, Bill. How are you? Yeah, good morning, uh, sir. Uh, thanks for being there for us. Uh, I have a question about Social Security. Both my wife and I are 75, but my wife just on real receiving Social Security and Medicare. But my wife decides to uh, partake in a little gig, and she receives a little uh, <clears throat> paycheck. Well, Social Security is withheld from that paycheck, does that uh, <clears throat> withholding affect our Medicare yearly payment adversely or not? So the only way that you affect your Medicare premium payment <clears throat> is if you are on Medicare and you exceed your IRMA limits, yes. which married filing jointly in 2024 I don't have the chart in front of me, but I believe it's MAGI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income, right at about 174 or 175. So yes. if your income is below that, then you won't have any extra premiums in your Medicare payments. Well, I know of that uh, payment, but uh, <clears throat> I looked at our current statement for next year, and I see there was an increase, probably about two hundred dollars in my magi. I mean, I mean for the Medicare pay- payment, and I'm wondering uh, the effect of her working. What was your please. What was your income, Bill? Did your income go up above that that rate? And remember, when you're looking at Irma, it's a two year look back. They're looking okay. at your tax return two years ago, not not this current year or the year before. So for your Medicare premiums in 2024, they're actually looking at your 2022 tax return. All right. Okay. All right. That answers okay. my question. Thank you very much, sir. Absolutely. Let me let me do something for you here, Bill, real quick. I'm going to put you on hold, and we'll send you out a whole, a whole uh, ex- explanation on IRMA and how to look at it and the IRMA exception forms as well, okay? Okay, Let me go ahead and put you on hold, and Bob will get your information from that for, uh, to send it out to you as well. Appreciate the phone call. Hey, you're listening to Making Money Sense. Give us a ring, 855-ROSE-123. Let's bring Christy on the line from North Carolina. Good morning, Christy. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. How can I help you? Um, I have recently heard about using your IRA to buy investment property mm-hmm. and was wondering if you've got any any thoughts on that i do you can you can do a self-directed ira and purchase uh real estate inside of it there are special firms that set that up for you now you have to be aware of of the risks of this 
and the risks fall under the internal revenue section. It's, it's called, I don't know what section it is, but it's called self-dealing rules. Because you're only allowed to contribute so much money each year if you're working into an IRA. So if you have, mm-hmm. let's, let's say, 200000 uh, you know, uh, let's say $500,000 property inside of an IRA that you're doing, uh, self-directed through one of these programs, and all of a sudden the dishwasher, the plumbing, and the driveway need repair, and there's no cash inside the IRA to do so, and you go ahead, well, let's go ahead and do that. Now you're contributing, and you can break it and become self-dealing rules, and the whole thing would be taxable to you. So, so it's, it's, uh, it sounds great at first, but there are very specific steps and rules and requirements uh, that you need to do. As a matter of fact, there's a book by Ed Slot called The Ticking Time Bomb, The Retirement Ticking Time Bomb, or something like that, which goes through details on self-dealing. You might want to get a copy of that book and read that before you do it, okay? And if you like, I can send you out some information on it all. But yes, you can do that. Now, there are other ways to put real estate into your IRAs. You can buy a mutual fund, an ETF, or individual stocks that hold real estate for you, and therefore you never have to worry about self-dealing rules. It's just like another investment inside your IRA. It's liquid. It's transparent. You can put stop losses on it, receive dividends, all kinds of things in there. And it takes away that downside risk of of unnecessary excessive tax exposure if you get caught in the self-dealing mistake. Okay? Okay. So if you like, I'll, I'll, I'll put you on hold, and Bob will get your contact information, and we'll send you out some information on that. Would that be okay? Yes, sir. That'd be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate the phone call. Let me place you on a quick hold there, Christy. You listen to Making Money Sense. Give us a ring, 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. Let's bring Bill on from Florida. Oop. I think I, I think he, we just missed him. Let's bring James on from Maryland. Good morning, James. How are you today? Yeah, how are you doing, Larry? I'm well. How can I help you, sir? Yeah, um, I have an investment property, but when my mom passed away years ago with a two, uh, it's like an apartment house down in Canton, Maryland, and I still have her name on it and my name on it, and my own house, I have like a nice custom home I built, and the kids all in college and on their own, and I got my name on that and my wife's name, but I, I just got to change all these names off the deeds, I guess, and just in case something happens to me, I heard, you know, say for me and my wife die in an accident or something, um... I wanted to go to the kids and not have a inherited tax taken out or something like that. They have to pay. Yes. Um, what's the best? What's the best thing I could do with something like this? Okay, so so you threw a lot of houses and names and 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 relationships at me there real quick. So I didn't catch it all. But but here's yeah. what here's the exercise, James. Write down the, the houses, house number one, house number two, house number three, so forth and so on. And then right, write right. down who owns it, who's on the title of that house right now. Gotcha. Okay. Right, Th- right. That's all you need to do. And then ask the question, if something happens to those people that are on that house, where does it go? So you might own a house now with, with you know, just yourself, and you might have it inside of a trust, and it goes to your kids. That's going to pass without probate. They get a stepped-up basis in value, no tax exposure, everything's great. On the other hand, you might own the home, and then the second column says, there's no way it passes to anybody because there's no beneficiary attached to it or joint ownership or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Then you've got a probate issue, right? Or if you own a home now, let's say you bought the home for four hundred grand and you have your child's name on that house and it's worth eight hundred grand, right? And right. so you say, right. well, I, I want think- it to pass to the child, mm-hmm. and so I'm going to put the child's name on the house now. And then something happens to you, the child has the house. They assume your four hundred thousand dollar cost basis. They'd have to pay taxes if they sold it on that four hundred thousand dollar gain in that example. But you can avoid that tax by making it a TOD uh, transfer on death or putting it into a mm-hmm. simple garden variety revocable living trust, and then that's going to save you taxes on four hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so so the exercise is this: is write down the homes, write down who's on the title of the homes, and the next column over, write down where you want it to go and how it's going to get there. And if there's blanks there, that's where we need to fill in, okay? We need to look at it from a tax perspective and an ease of transition perspective and bloodline protection to your heirs on where you want it to go. 
So, so that's the exercise, James, right there. And if you want, I'll go ahead and I'll put you on hold. And we'll get some information out to you on that. I'll have one of the advisors reach out to you next week and sort of step you through that a little bit, okay? Because with different right, properties, right. you want to look at the different different ways that, that things can be held in title. And you want to take a look at, is it primary residence? Is it rental property? Rental property number one, have you been depreciating it upon sale? You've got a depreciation yeah. recapture. You've got a lot of stuff going on there, okay? Yeah, so I'll be happy to do that for you if you like. Okay. Um, yep. A quick question. I have um, the rental properties are paid off for that, which is good. My house, like I owe like one hundred twenty-five, but like you're saying, it's worth like six hundred and fifty thousand. But you know, I'm getting up older in age too, so I, you know, I have to. It's a lot of stuff to do, and I didn't know whether to get a lawyer real quick or. or I, I, but I heard your show a couple of times on a Saturday because I work down with DC. Uh-huh. I thought I got to call you. Hey, I got to call you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the deal, James. Do you need to run and get an attorney involved? No. F- not now. Okay. What we need to do is build a plan on it first. We need to take a look at everything. Then we'll gotcha. bring the attorney in and tell him and her what we uh-huh. need legally transacted on your behalf. But let's take a look that at tax minimization strategies. Let's take a look at how things pass. You know, what happens if, if you become incapacitated and you're in your home? How are we going to then use the proceeds of that home in a tax efficient manner for your care? So, so those are things that we would outline with you in a financial planning conversation. Then we go to the attorney and say, this is what we need done, A, B, C, and D, that type of thing. Oh, my goodness. That sounds like so much. I'm looking in a, in a phone book for, for lawyers now. And, you know, I'm, you know I'm this, this really helps me out a lot. Well, we've got a handful of them over. I see you're calling from Maryland. We've got a handful of them over in Maryland that we will refer you to, okay? Okay. Sounds Let me great. put you on hold. You, Bob will get your contact information real quick. I want to pick up some other callers here, and we'll have someone reach out to you next week and, for, and get that thing going for you. Okay, James? Okay, thank you. Sounds great. Have a good weekend. Let me put you on hold. Yes, sir. Appreciate the phone call. Hey, you're listening to Making Money Sense. Give us a ring, 855-ROSE-123. We've got Bill back on the line from Florida. Good morning, Bill. How are you today? Good morning. Great show, guys. Great show. Thank you. I'm I'm a personal representative. I'm currently a personal representative for my family's estate, and uh, a lot of things I could have done a little bit different. I was too trusting. And maybe you can address some ways to, for future people, uh, personal representatives in addressing their estate and how they handle affairs. Uh, it's amazing how family suddenly comes out, produces information that wasn't there before. And then after two years of us going through this, this uh, probate uh, process, uh, family introduces more paperwork stating that, you know, they have... They've been forgiven debt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, request, we requested a inventory. We sat down, and the two, there's four, four parties involved, four heirs. <clears throat> two of the heirs held property and would not release it unless the other two heirs agreed with a property value of real estate, 50% of what it was actually valued. And then they fought tooth and nail to have it appraised. And looking back on it, I should have just had the appraisal no matter what. I tried, I tried to get their agreement with it. Really, I didn't have to have that. I was just trying to keep peace. Uh, my recommendation would be make sure you get everything in writing. Make sure everybody turns in uh, what they're claiming. And maybe you can address a little bit more on that and how we can better protect ourselves in the future. First of all, Bill, I'm very sorry for your loss, and I'm very sorry also on top of that to hear that you're going through these struggles with your family. You were placed in the position of of executor because you were the one that was going to keep peace and do things the way the deceased person really wanted them to be done, and now you've got people coming at you at all different angles. Unfortunately... Unfortunately, I see this story often, okay? And, the, the, you know, when, when you asked what would I do if I was the executor of, and, and I have been, okay, of, of an estate, I would, I would, the first thing I say is, look, here's the deal. I am going to collect all the information that I can possibly find 
and we're not going to distribute anything until I'm confident that we can start distributing things and go from there. And I've, and I've, uh, I've actually had one family member say, would you do it for me? And I said, you know, yours is very simple. You don't need to do it. You know, just, just have your two kids sit down and it's done. And that's, that's what happened as well. So I, I empathize with you. There's no right or wrong way to deal with the family dynamics and things like that and just do the best that you can. But you're going to have to make some hard decisions. And sometimes those hard decisions, you know, just keep in mind what the deceased person wanted to do and what your legal uh, obligations are in a fiduciary role to do as the estate person. And unfortunately, it sounds like it's going to come down to this attorney versus that attorney on splitting up assets. So, um, it's a tough thing. And I often recommend to clients when we're having these discussions, when you look at the three phases of financial planning, accumulation, distribution, and then legacy, passing assets on, I often tell clients, we need to have a family meeting. We need to sit down and take a look at what you have and where you want it to go and how you want it to go. Because that way, if there is somebody there who has been forgiven some debts, from the deceased person. It's in writing and everybody knows about it ahead of time. That's called a state equalization, right? Um, so, so I just, I've, I'm sorry that you're going through this. I, 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 I don't know how I can help because the horse is already out of the barn with the scenario other than, you know, be a sounding board for you at this point. Um, but it's, it's going to boil down to eventually family, family members cooperating. And if that doesn't happen, that's why we have judges. That that's that that's ultimately what's going to happen there. So I'm sorry that you're going through that, Bill. That's okay. Correct. Yep. Hey, I enjoy you guys' show. You're you're giving some very very gold nugget information. So keep it up. I appreciate that. No worries. Hey, listen, I'm going to put you on a quick hold, and I'm just going to send you out our financial planning toolkit, and maybe you can pass that around for yourself and to your family. You know, sure. because it sounds like. Thanks. Maybe some people down there need to sort of draw a line in the sand and start looking at their situation uh, for, for retirement planning. So, Bill, it sounds like you're in a car. I'm, I'm going to put you on hold here. Bob will get some information from you. So drive safe and have a great weekend. Appreciate the phone call. Dial us up at 855-ROSE-123. Go check out my website, LarryRosenthal.com. Sign up for our newsletter. We send out a weekly market commentary. Mid-morning, late morning, every Monday morning on what has happened in the markets. Uh, go check us out at our, uh, on the radio link there at LarryRosenthal.tv. You can watch us live stream the show on YouTube. And again, I announced this the other day that we will be having a, what we're going to be calling, uh, I don't know what we're going to call it right now, <laughs> Larry Learning Minutes or something like Let's that. But that. we're going to be like doing... It. A handful of broadcasts live during market times uh, starting in April uh, on LarryRosenthal.tv. So check that out here coming up soon in April. Let's bring William on from Virginia. Good morning, William. How are you today? Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. I appreciate your show. Um, Larry, I have a property that uh, I I, uh, still have a mortgage on. I uh, have equity uh, almost equal to the balance of my mortgage. Uh, I want to access the equity without refinancing because of the interest rate I have is like a four uh, four point seven percent seven five, and I want to access the equity without refinancing. A friend suggested a reverse mortgage. I just wanted your opinion on that, and would you have any other uh, suggestions to access the equity? Yes, sir. So, uh, William, first of all, how old are you? Uh, 68. Okay. I think you need to be 62 minimum to, uh, to get a reverse mortgage. Most reverse mortgages require the home to be paid for or very close to be paid for. So a 50-50 loan to debt ratio, I'm not sure that it's going to... Chris, can you put the clock up? I hear music. I don't know where we're at. Yeah, oh, I see it. Okay. Um, Listen, William, here's what I need to do. I'm going to put you on hold. I've got 43 seconds. i got to close out the show. But I'm going to put you on hold, and I'll come back on after the show's off the air and pick you back up. So just give me about 30 seconds here, and I'll pick you back up in in one second. And for those of you that are watching on LarryRosenthal.tv on YouTube, we'll continue to live stream while I'm answering William's question there. So got off to a rocky start today, Chris, with technology, (laughs) but we pulled it off, right? You did. You did. Absolutely. So... 
Check out our, our website, LarryRosendahl.tv. Next week, we're going to be opening up the registration for our March webinar on tough retirement questions to be answered. So for Bob in the back and Chris McKay, I'm Larry Rosenthal. Have a wonderful week. Enjoy the Super Bowl. We'll be back next Saturday with more Making Money Sense. i pick up William again there. Good morning, William. Thank you for holding there. Um, so Thanks again. Mo- Thank you, Michael. Yep, absolutely. Most reverse mortgages require you to have, you know, 80, 90 percent equity inside of the home in order to obtain that. But but let me let me just ask, ask you back. Why do you want to access the equity? Maybe there's other options that we can do uh, because there's three ways to access equity and and major reasons why uh, in inside homes. What's your purpose here? What do you want to try to do? Well, the major reason is to eliminate what debt I have remaining, uh, which which is about uh, $60,000 worth of debt. And then I believe I can uh, comfortably retire versus continuing working at a part-time, uh, in a part-time status. And to- is this debt on <laughs> credit cards? Is it car payments? Where is this debt located? One is a uh, yes, uh, both a mixture of credit card and a second mortgage on on the property. On the uh, very so, same property we're talking about. The very same property. Okay, so this property that we're talking about, William, is it is it rented? No, actually, I'm living in it. It's a condominium, uh, um, but the uh, value of the location. I'm in Annandale, Virginia. Um, has um, more than grown. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, You're inside the Beltway. Do you own another yeah. property, or is this the only property that you own? This is the only property there. Okay, so so this just simply comes down to cash flow, and there's a there's a strategy called equity exchange. Okay, so so we've got equity exchange. Let's look at it. That you're willing to exchange the equity in your home for a bad non deductible debt. So I'm just going to give you some some numbers here as an example. These aren't your numbers, but I'll just give you the numbers as an example. Let's suppose that your mortgage payment is $3,000 a month, not including taxes and insurance, but just the principal and interest is three grand a month, okay? Now, your debts, the car payments, the credit cards, and anything else, let's suppose that's two grand a month, okay? So debt obligation is 5000 a month in this example. You with me? Mm-hmm. Now, if we go to the bank and we say we want to do what's called a refi cash out, where we refinance your home, even though the interest rate will be higher than what you have today, but we pull equity out to pay off these other debts, now maybe your mortgage payment goes to 4000 a month from three, but you pay off your other debts, now you're saving a thousand dollars a month in cash flow. Okay. Then you can take that extra thousand dollars a month and you can apply it towards principal and accelerate down this new loan if you wanted to. Or just keep it the way it is. Plus yeah. another advantage is you get to now reestablish a new higher uh uh tax deduction um, well, it needs to go to the original acquisition cost, so you might not be able to do that. But you're still going to get interest to be able to write off. You need, we need to talk to a tax preparer on that, on the amount right there. Mm-hmm. But this is simply a cash flow thing, and what I can do is I can, I can have one of our advisors reach out to you next week and show you how a, a true equity exchange works. But that's what you're okay. talking about is an equity exchange strategy. We've done many, many of these over the years for people like this, and it saves you cash flow. And you'd be surprised, like, how many years left are on your house right now? Uh, Larry, I owe, I owe like, 100000 on it. Mm-hmm. Um, um, it. It was a 30-year, it was a 30-year loan. Uh, I can't give you the exact number of years on it remaining, but... Uh, That's fine. So uh, it sounds like it's being paid down pretty well at this point. Yeah. So this is just a matter of cash flow. Do we want to look to extend the loan out further in order to give you more cash flow relief so you can retire? That's what this is going to boil down to. So we need to do an exercise on this to see what's in your best interest, okay? Okay. 
Yep. Let me put you on hold, William. We'll have somebody, uh, Bob will pick up in a moment, get your contact information, and then we'll have somebody, Bob, you want to make a note, this needs to be an equity exchange, okay? So we'll we'll have somebody uh, uh, reach out to you next week. Let me place you on hold here, we, William. Appreciate the phone call. Hey, those of you that are listening on, watching on LarryRosenthal.tv, give us a call, 855-ROSE-123. Let's welcome... Yeah, we've got a couple of questions there on the Is this on the Tessa from Maryland? Okay, yep, we'll... I see the chat. Uh, let me... Uh, let me pick this caller up for you. You got it. You got it. Is this is Tes- uh, Tesfa. 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 Yes. Hi. Hi, Larry. Hi. How are you? How can I help All you? Right. Um, yeah. First time caller. Um, I have uh, I have about uh, a few properties in Philadelphia that I'm I'm renting out. Uh, it's not big properties. They probably worth a hundred or maybe less. Some of them. Uh, most of them, I have them. I own them free and clear. Uh, but I also live in Maryland, and I have a property here. But I just want to know. Uh, I I recently got married, and I have two kids, and I'm the sole provider for, for the family. Um, I have maybe about four hundred thousand dollars insurance, life insurance. But I want to know how I could uh, protect my assets in case something happened to me, or maybe put on a trust. Uh, who do I talk to? What's the right people to talk to? Or yeah, should I transfer to the LLC? You know, those things. Yeah, you, you. this is more of a legal question, okay, on how do you protect mm-hmm. from a lawsuit or protect if something happens to you and you're incapacitated and you have to go into a nursing Correct. home or if you pass. So, so what right. our process usually is, is, and we talked a little bit about this show, uh, about this process earlier in the show, is we need to take an inventory right. of all of your assets and then write down how they're titled and then write down what happens if you're incapacitated or if you pass away, how do those assets go or if, if, or, or if a lawsuit comes at you. That's the information mm-hmm. then that we would take to the attorney to do that. Whether or not you have mm-hmm. an individual LLC for each property um, you know, that's usually the way things play out from a safety standpoint. So a little bit of estate planning work to be done there, and we can send you some information out on that and get you started down the road with that. We'll need to have okay. uh, some attorneys in Maryland and some in Pennsylvania probably. Uh, and I have some, mm-hmm. some outlets for you in, in, in both of those states as far as that goes, okay? Okay, great, great. Yeah, yeah that's, I'll put uh, you on I a quick hold. to guide me. Yeah, okay. that's that's what you need. You you need some guidance here, and then what's in your best interest, and see what you can do with all the different properties and stuff like that, and the future of income with those properties. Where do you want that income to go? Should you pass as well? Where do you want the ownership to go, and then where do you want the income to go? Because they can go in different places if you like too. So okay, okay. Yeah, so a lot of things like that, funneling them through a trust as well. Let me put you on hold, mm-hmm. and uh, Bob will get your contact information, and we'll have someone give you a ring next week. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate Absolutely. It. Appreciate the phone call. Have a good weekend. Let's go ahead and bring Brownie on the line from Maryland. Good morning, Brownie. How are you today? Very good. Thank you. How can I help you? Well, I did all that with the Stouffer Legal Group in Baltimore. How can I help you? have a question, Brownie? Last question you asked. Uh, Yes, how can you police the market from cheaters? Police the market. That's right. Uh, that's what regulators do. FINRA, SEC. I, I, I don't, I don't, don't know what you're talking about here. Brownie, you with, you're with us. I'm here. Uh, Sorry. Okay, what is what's your question for Larry? Do you have a question for Larry? You're doing an Enron scandal. I lost a lot of money. Oh, yeah, Brent, I tell you what, we're going to put you back on hold here and uh, answer some other questions, and Bob may be able to help you offline there a little bit, I think, okay? Thank you so much for the call. Uh, we've got some questions here on YouTube, Larry, that need to be answered. Let's go grab those. Um, here's the first one. Hi, I enjoy listening to the show. I have a question on donor advice funds for appreciated stock. Are you able to take the entire amount as a tax deduction on the stock value sent to the DAF. When you give appreciated asset, you are allowed to give the entire value 
but you can write off up to 30% of your adjusted gross income in the current year, and then anything above that, it carries over for another five years. So you got one plus five years to, 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 to do that. Now, if the amount of appreciated stock that you're going to give will exceed the one plus five years of your uh, adjusted gross income, then you may want to split that gift into multiple years so you can carry it forward seven, eight, nine years down the road depending on, on what your tax return looks like. But that's the answer. So sometimes we'll actually look at doing split-year gifts when it goes into donor-advised funds. Cool. Um, and then in, uh, on Ward had this question related to Michelle's question earlier in the show about retitling a home. Are there tax implications or costs associated with that other than attorney costs? No. That's too short an answer, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that. Okay. So I guess the answer is no there on Ward. Thank you so much for that question on, on YouTube here today. Appreciate that very much. And I think that's, that's all we've got at the moment, Larry. All right. Sounds good. Well, hey, everybody on YouTube, thanks for watching. Go ahead and subscribe. And don't forget to check out our website at RosenthalWealthManagement.com or LarryRosenthal.com. Sign up for our newsletter. And uh, next week we'll be opening up the registration for our March 7th webinar. Have a great weekend.